Lesha Mirlichuk uh, is a Ukrainian Holodomor researcher based in Western Australia, writing about the period of Russian genocide from 1932 to 1933. She's always been passionate about Ukrainian history, and one of her latest projects is based around eyewitness interviews. Since the full-scale war, she's been fundraising for Ukraine, as well as assisting those who arrived in Perth, Western Australia, since the war began. Welcome to Silicon Curtain Channel. Please do like and definitely subscribe. Share the channel around to help more people discover the fantastic speakers that we have got on the channel. Um, I'm, I, I'd say, I'm delighted to speak to you. But this is, this is, of course, is a deeply uh, tra traumatic topic. This is the second time we're covering the Holodomor. So, if people are interested in this topic after watching this video, they should go uh, back and watch the one from last year with Bohdan uh, Kravchenko. Um, welcome to the channel. Thank you. It's it's a delight to be here. I feel I feel quite honoured, and I feel um, it, it's uh, it's difficult when you're so far away from the rest of the world. It, it's quite isolating here in the west of Australia. And in terms of this particular study, the Holodomor, when I started it, um, I was the only researcher historian in Australia that was bothering to tackle it. So it was a very isolating experience. And did you have the benefit of uh, family connections? Did you have many sort of uh, uh, family members, perhaps with some direct connection or stories or memories of that period? Or are you really relying on, uh, you know, trying to reach other witnesses or, you know, archival sources? Uh, there was um, a, a paternal grandmother um, to my children who had lived through this. And I had listened to her stories for some years. Uh, did I believe them? Uh, I have to say I, I listened with an open mind, but... Again, the history was so unknown at the time. So when I did start the work, it was 2003, and I'd known her for some years um, and really started this work uh, because it was suggested to me to do it. I had actually started another PhD uh, within my university and uh, hosted um, someone from Canada who basically told me I was being silly, I should probably have a look at the whole of the mod as the archives had been opened up in Russia and in Ukraine. And so that was really how it started. And my basic response to him was, well, I know nothing about this. We, we don't have, um, uh, we don't have staff here. We don't have academics who actually work in this field of Ukrainian history or in any field, actually, the, the Ukrainian academics were very thin on the ground. Um, but the study started with me having a look at some research material and thinking hard about the conversations I'd had with this lady. And to be quite honest, our community here in Perth in Western Australia is tiny compared to the rest of Australia and overseas. So the post-war DPs uh, were were just a very small community. And luckily for me, I had a, a father who was very involved with pretty much all of them. He attended both churches or three churches. There's a Baptist or there was a Baptist, our Orthodox Church and our Ukrainian Greek Catholic Church. So my father knew people and I was toted around a lot uh, as the child and very much involved with the Ukrainian activities, um, you know, dancing and, and singing and um, just being a Ukrainian child and always at church. So people knew me as well. And then when it came to, to start this particular study, uh, I had a community who were ostensibly my family. They, they were my extended family. We all cared about each other. That's how small the community was at the time. So it made it easy for me to start to uh, request for people to be interviewed by me. Um, it could have been really difficult, but a very close friend of mine uh, knew the story from her own mother. And um, 
well, she didn't force her mother into talking to me. I would say she cajoled her mother into talking to me. And she was probably, apart from uh, my children's paternal grandmother, this lady was the first serious interviewee that I, um, I was able to talk to. And then it was just the old snowball effect. As people realised what I was doing and whose daughter I, I was, um, slowly but surely they would start contacting me or somebody would contact me and say, Mrs. So-and-so uh, would be interested in talking to you. Here is her number. She's waiting for you to call. And so, look, it, it, it wasn't quick. Um, it probably took about three good years for me to finally get 40 solid interviews. Um, and I fortunately recorded, I videoed five of them. So uh, in the final book of narratives, I actually had it set up as an ebook. And so on Amazon, you can get into those interviews uh, in that section belonging to that particular survivor and all the details of the survivor. So I was pretty lucky. I wish I'd actually videoed the whole lot of them. Yeah. Uh, that would have been perfect. But, you know, uh, this was not just not my field. And so I was, I was learning as I was moving along myself. And, of course, that generation is, is passing now. It's more and more difficult to, uh, to meet people who would have direct experience of, of, of that um so this is you know what you're doing there is an invaluable uh first party uh sort of reference um what did you find in the stories i mean then obviously they're highly individual stories people would have had different experiences but what was the commonality that you saw um in what people were telling you there was quite a common theme throughout uh, all of them. Obviously, the hunger, the ab absolute um, palpable uh, feeling of hunger. Um, uh, and not able to access um, any type of food. Once, once the, the, the Russians were sending out their komsomols with the shtabets. So the shtabets were just long steel poles and they would poke around uh, the ground on the exterior of the homes and also inside because the inside of the homes were just dirt or mud. Uh, they would poke in there in case people had hidden food, as they had done, let's face it. Um, so th this feeling of we, we can't even find anything. So they were starting to eat leaves off trees. You know, trees lost their leaves. There were no weeds. Uh, there was no vermin to be had in the end because whatever there was would be caught and consumed. Um, so the whole food and lack of food obviously was um, palpable. But bread, bread became such a a focus of these people um, to, to this day, um, my mother's 99 and she still has this, um, not a love, but it's a reverence towards bread and not white bread because that's, that's cheap bread. It's the good rye bread. And, you know, that's not not uh, easy for me to find. In fact, she lived with me for about nine years. She's currently in a nursing home, but to find this rye bread that she absolutely uh, covets. So bread became a huge issue um, and having to go and line up for bread or if they happen to be working in a collective farm. So once they were forced out of their properties um, and they were having to um, work on the collectives, um, bread, access to bread was just massive. Um, and, you know, the mind becomes uh, twisted when, when one becomes so hungry. And the one thing that they talked about a lot was how people just went mad. And um, it wasn't just adults, but children. Um, there is a word in Ukrainian, um, um, they, they were just going mad. Um, they were hungry. They, they were just starving hungry. And so people did terrible things. Um, I remember um, 
I can't remember if the lady actually raised it or where I actually had to intervene, but people cannibalised at the end of it. They had nothing left. And so if a person died or if a child died, they cannibalised. Uh, that was all they had to eat. And they would find body parts um, in... in um, little meatballs and, and any sort of foodstuffs that they could muster up. And this woman was just beside herself, but I'd heard of it. And so I had actually gone and done some research about it. And I said, do you realise, and they kept saying, we're so sinful, you know, God is punishing us. That was one of the other massive things that came out of it. God is was punishing us. And I, I remember saying at one stage, goodness me, what on earth would God be punishing you for? Um, no, well, God must, God is punishing us. And uh, and getting back to the cannibaliz cannibalization, I, I did say to this one particular lady, she was so distressed and fortunately I had done some reading. And I said, do you realize that the church doesn't condemn this? that if you are in this sort of situation that the church accepts, I'm trying to use really careful language here, the church accepts that this is your only alternative. She didn't believe me. She was so entrenched mm. in the teaching of, the, of herself um, and the belief that God must be punishing them. So, yeah, they, these are common threads. So bread, the absolute starvation and people being really strange and um i mean let's face it if uh, god is going to choose an instrument for his retribution he's not going to choose russia for a start you know that is the <laughs> uh, the least uh, moral authority in the world uh, for that but well did they ever people... think to blame russia anyway you know that they didn't they although russia was creating so much havoc around them wanting to take away any semblance of their independence uh, of their Ukrainianism, of their, their nationality, their language, didn't matter what Russia was trying to do. Uh, Russia, you know, Stalin was the overriding um, leader and and there was this sense of, well, you do what you're told. Um, mm. That's a really find... interesting point because before we started, mm. we talked about one of the challenges of Holodomor studies in this area and it's mm. a very fertile area either for people who want to, you know, to create a particular uh, academic narrative themselves. One could even be cynical and say it's also a fertile area for Russian disinformation, uh, which, of course, oh, is, is now a big thing. It was then and now. And it yes. was then. And you raise an mm -hmm. interesting point that people may not have seen it as a genocide. Not everyone would have seen a genocide at the time. And no. there are certain academics who still claim that it was a class-based extermination they don't necessarily mm. belittle the the horror of it but they say it was class-based rather than directed mm. at ukrainians per se um but the fact is i'd, like to, read, I'd like to read some if i can interject i'd love to read you something now this is published in 1953 so the stalin famine and i was born in 1954 so i actually find this quite interesting so they're talking about the famine being the climax and the most tragic moment of of this whole liquidization of the the uh the classes of the kurkuz as ukrainians call them they're not kulaks um and she says it was the diabolical answer of the kremlin to the inflexible struggle of the ukrainian people for the right to their soil and for freedom to till it for their native language and for an independent national existence. My goodness, you know, Ukrainians knew it a long time ago, but those facing it at the time, um, I see it now. I see it now um, with Ukrainian uh, DPs arriving here. There is there's such a split in people's thinkings and of course because I've done the Holodomor research and that whole eastern block is where Stalin was moving in Russians to relocate and and take up the the homes that it had been starved out so ostensibly that eastern 
uh, Donbass region is historically from those Holodomor years. And so when you try and, and get some understanding of, you know, do, do you realise that was all orchestrated? And so all of your thinking has come from many years back of the early 30s. Um, I, I find the whole thing just absolutely frustrating to, to have done the Holodomor study. And I think I must have been one of first researchers at the time. And I think because I was not so heavily uh, embodied in the whole research uh, arena out there in the world, um, because by the time I started, people had been starting to get into the archives. Being so isolated, I could take a really clear picture here. So I could look at Lemkin's uh, information about how to classify a genocide. And with all of my research work from the narratives, I mean, we've got, I think, one person left who is a survivor. Um, they've all gone. And thank goodness I managed to collect 40 good, solid interviews. But at the end of it all, and then by then I had pulled together a lot of research. Um, thank you for the internet. That was wonderful. And four trips back to Ukraine, speaking to uh, Stanislav Kolshitsky, one of, one of Ukraine's senior research uh, professors over there, and also going to the Kiev Mohylanska uh, University and you know, just managing to speak to people on the ground in Ukraine who actually did have a good understanding of what had happened. And by then they had collected a lot of interviews themselves. But, you know, I ran into a lady, this is in one of the parks in Kiev, uh, just strolling around, trying to get away from everything, from the universities and talking to people. And there was this old babushka begging. And I stopped, as I do, and I asked her, Do does she remember those years? And it was the typical reaction. Oh, it was terrible. And, you know, God was um, punishing us. And I look, what do you say? And this lady was living there in Ukraine. And yeah, it's very frustrating. But I came away after my study being quite firm in the notion that it was a genocide from everything that I knew. And I had people professors telling me, like you said earlier, you know, oh, well, no, it was a class uh, struggle and it was this and it was, and oh, look, it was only about 3,000 that perished through starvation. And I'm saying, have a look at the stats, um, the census statistics. How do you explain such a massive loss of life? Um, and then you'll start to see now, the more you have a look at people's research, you're starting to see yeah, it could be anything between 10 to 10, 10 7, sorry, 7 to 10 million who who actually fell prey to the to the starvation. So it, it's still fraught with all sorts of um, difficulty, this study. And of course, now it's totally overridden by by the new genocide. I call it out. It's a genocide. And in some ways, I think. What's happening now, the images from Mariupol, um, Irpin, Butcher, and the quite clear through Donbass, um, Crimea and Mariupol, although it's not going too well, apparently, the intent mm -hmm. to replace local citizens with Russian colonizers is absolutely clear. Um, yeah. It's happening you know. again. It's happening again. That in some ways, does it make the historic incidents of the genocide actually more believable for more people? I have to say, I sit back and I'm doing a lot of watching. I became very involved with getting the feeds of what was going on in Ukraine initially and for all of last year, as we all did. But now I'm becoming a little more circumspect and watching carefully as to what is going on. Um, I have a friend, I was telling you, who's, who's in the military, and he has published a book on Mariupol. He has images. He has a dry, he, he is involved in photography, he loves photography. So he has this book about Mariupol and how it was before it went through um, the steel uh, plant being absolutely... Um, but obviously they've degraded the infrastructures to such an extent. Let's go back to the Holodomor because 
again, there are other um, genocidal features um, that are less well known, but Ukrainians are starting to try to educate people about it. But it's concerning, isn't it? And this may be a function of how academia works, but there seems to be a disconnection between the events, whereas in reality, there probably would have been a strong connection. One of those, of course, is the executed Renaissance, where the entire generation of uh, Ukrainian authors, artists, creators, musicians, all rounded up, and in a relatively short space of time, all executed uh, in a forest outside Kiev. Um that well, is now because they are the, the harbors of, of the history and uh the ethnicity of the country. They had to be eradicated. The intelligentsia had to be eradicated because you, as Stalin used to say, you can control the peasants, or so he thought, um, but you've got to get rid of the intelligentsia, the call it the hierarchy. Uh, and so they were the first to go. They were either chucked out to Siberia or he executed them. And predominantly uh, execution was the better course. In and his far eyes. more comprehensive and carried out in a far swifter time frame than the attack on the Russian intelligence here, which played out over many, many more years, but in some cases with, with the same sort of lethal uh, results. But also... Mm -hmm. What was striking um, in the last interview, there was a photograph of actually the entire Ukrainian Communist Party, the sort of equivalent mm -hmm. of the Politburo. Uh, and you've got mm -hmm. hundreds of delegates there who attended mm -hmm. the conference. In that massive hall. Yeah, in the, the massive hall. And then you learn that every single one of them was executed. Now, these are their oh. own people. These are their own yes. sort of, you know, communists. But... That also, mm -hmm. to me, is strong evidence that this is exactly directed towards Ukrainianness. We cannot have Ukrainianness in politics, in literature. Mm -hmm. We cannot have that identity emerging in the cannot, countryside. Yes, you cannot dare to have them anywhere where they might have some power. And even in the Communist Party, there's seeming power to be had. And so we can't we can't keep them there either, because you can't really trust a Ukrainian. You see, they want to be independent, and they might have curtailed to be communists for a time. I mean, they had to sign up if they wanted to be safe. They had to sign up. Well, did they really want to be communists? No, they wanted to save themselves and their families. I mean, we we have people who who came here post-war, and that was something that they spoke about, to save themselves and their families, they signed that piece of paper. So, yeah. Yeah. It's and interesting. Even... One of the things that I've been looking at recently that a lot of people don't know about, so during this, this time of, of famine, um, Ukrainians were... Uh, Ukrainians were selling off, it wasn't selling per se, any, any gold they might have had, any um, family heirlooms that they might have had that could have been traded for, uh, for bread or for or some sort of currency. They were, although they'd hidden it in the beginning to try and save it, they were pulling it out and they were trading it. And so it was these trudeden payments so you 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 either received a bit of um, money uh, for working at the collective farm, uh, or you you gave up something that you had of value in order to save yourself, basically. So Ukraine lost not only the intellectual property, but any artifacts per se that that showcased Ukrainian heritage um, or or family. Um, heirlooms it all went um, where has it all gone it's gone it's out there um, they didn't melt down every piece of gold they had um, so that that all interests me um, very much there, there's so much untold so 
it's interesting, uh, people didn't know of the, the bards. So the Ukrainian uh, bandura players, the bards, predominantly blind. So they were the storytellers of the, of the countryside and they would move around the villages and they would sing the songs of the history of Ukraine. Um, so where um, villages may not have been um, literate, uh, the history was told through these, through the bards. They would sing the the history, um, and they Stalin got rid of the the bandura players as well. Again, got about three thousand of them into a conference hall, and that was the end of them. So there are. I think we're not getting the the complete picture. I think there's a lot that has happened that has gone for history. Um, and um, sometimes I, I think, Lisa, you have to let it go um, because I'm not in Ukraine. The one thing that really interests me at the moment, and this sounds quite ghoulish, is with all of the, the bombing and the mines that have been set off, uh, although we, we have some idea of where the mass graves are uh, from the Holodomor, um, not everybody was found. So we have Mohele graves, mass graves, and we do have stones commemorating where they are in most of the oblasts in the, um, in the, the regions. But there are many that were lost. They, they died, they starved. Babies, you know, they were small enough to really either incinerate or, or throw into these pits where they were putting uh, large numbers. I think they were waiting till they got about 60 bodies, whether they're half dead or not, and then they'd roll them into the pit. Um, and I think somewhere everywhere there are still graves that have not been uh, discovered. And I'm wondering whether with the, the landmines and everything, whether in fact some of those um, graves are being disturbed as well. And you know, everybody's so busy, sadly, with this horrible situation in Ukraine that I think a lot of things are now being um, compromised is probably the best way of putting it. I mean, on the other hand, there's an interesting process, isn't there, whereby people who were uh, brought up with Russian as their um, first language and potentially mm -hmm. Ukrainian as a second language, there is a major move uh, for people to learn Ukrainian, use Ukrainian. And whereas in, in Kiev, before you could have freely uh, used both. Like in Russian. Uh, mm. Now, now uh, it's, it's, it's changing. People uh, try not to. Uh, people insist uh, on being able to use uh, Ukrainian mm. in, in all circumstances. Um, mm. and, I think uh, you'll I, find also... President Zelensky has almost made it mandatory for you to converse in Ukrainian and everybody is trying mm. hard to, to converse in the Ukrainian language. They're trying to eradicate any semblance of uh, uh, Russian or Russification in the country as much as possible. Yeah. And I think that's, you know, some people say, oh, that's terrible, et cetera, et cetera. But actually it's because there is a heightened... Um, awareness that Russian is not a neutral language. It is used by an aggressor to leverage, to use its influence. And in the worst cases, it's the language associated with the most horrendous uh, violence. So people, uh, you know, feel, um, you know, it's traumatizing in some cases, re-traumatizing re to hear mm. it and, and see it. Um, and that brings me on to this question because you've talked a lot about the diaspora and you've talked about passing on histories and how Russia mm. actively through the thirties. And as we see now, uh, a lot of their activity is designed to break that connection with historical mm. narratives and break the connection between people, between generations, mm. et cetera. Mm. How important then is the Ukrainian diaspora? Because it seems to me that that's an incredibly important transition mechanism for these stories and the connections to the past, to Ukrainian identity, but also very important to galvanize, um, you know, charities, to galvanize even sort of commercial work, academic work for Ukraine, that the, the diaspora is connected and the Soviet Union failed to, to break that. So I'd, I'd love to hear your 
thoughts oh, on the that? diaspora the diaspora is the most important mechanism to keep the ukrainian culture uh the language um and the history because it's interesting i have such a bank of publications here in my home um three quarters of them i have donated to the university where i i completed my my degree um simply because i have no more room in my home but i have kept, kept certain titles um, many of them uh, totally out of print one that i picked up on uh, on the road in Podil, which is in uh, central Kiev. It's one of the oldest areas of Kiev. It was on the roadside. Um, I, I was looking for it. And um, I was in Podil this one Sunday, just wandering because it was a marketplace. And I saw that book. Well, it, it's produced by Memorial, which is uh, an organization in Ukraine that was collecting uh, interviews from survivors. And Memorial has been absolutely caned by, by Russia. In fact, they their premises were um, uh, raised, uh, they had a lot of trouble. Um, they're still around um, and there's a lot of material that they have collected. Anyway, so that was the book. So all of my materials, I was just saying to a colleague not two days ago, I in these last um, five years, I've been wondering what to do with the material that I have because I have probably got the best collection of Holodomor uh, publications in Australia. There's been no other academic who's taken up the mantle to do just the Hollow de Mod. Um, so um, Notre Dame University, where I completed it, has got some of them. Uh, and I have got the, the, the good choicest publications. And I have to decide what to do with them. And of course, now the decision is when Ukraine is being rebuilt, I will be sending all of my materials back again. And it's interesting because there is a, a man by the name of Morgan Williams, who is an American, and he collected artifacts, paintings, chalk drawings, anything and everything over a period of time. Um, I can send you material pertaining to him. He's won awards uh, from Ukraine, uh, very uh, highly respected man. And he has these massive paintings depicting so painted by people who remember the day and some of them you'll have seen in some publications they are actually in my books um so two meters by a meter uh, in diameter uh, in size and when i was in kiev and i saw this material uh, and it was all just loosely put together in an apartment um, because even back then, so this is 2004, um, he couldn't find somewhere to park all of this material. There was still a lot of impasse between Russian scholars and Ukrainian scholars. And so I still don't know where that material has gone now, but I have six of his paintings. Because I couldn't take anything out of the country, he digitally copied these paintings, these massive paintings. You would think that they are the original oil paintings. So I suspect there are many of us worldwide that have got the heritage. I call it the heritage of this country. And we will hopefully one day manage to pull it together um, to, to rebuild our history. However, getting back to your point about the diaspora, the diaspora is the point, it's on point for keeping the, the history, the language, our Ukrainian schools, they're back on board. So we've got families coming from Ukraine whose language is Russian. And so the children are being brought to the Ukrainian schools to learn our language. In fact, the parents are having to, we're running uh, lessons for adults to learn the language. Mind you, there are a lot who refuse to change. This is, I, I, have, I speak Russian and I'm going to speak Russian. Um, and that's unfortunate, but uh, so, so is the human uh, nature. Um, 
I do find it difficult um, because they just perpetuate in my mind this feeling of control that they are better the Russian speakers the Russian person is better than the Ukrainian that is how it comes across and I wanted to say earlier it, it was endemic in the early days of of history of gathering Ukrainian history if you did history as a PhD you had to learn the Russian language so it became this seemingly more valuable language than Ukrainian. And that's how it's been perceived. And it, so it perpetuated that feeling that Russia liked to have of, you know, little Ukraine. So if you are an academic, well, you, you are only an academic if you speak the Russian language. That is quite common. So you will know just from uh, academics anywhere, um, many of them speak Russian um, uh, and a lot of the documentation was then obviously um, published in the Russian language uh, it just constantly perpetuated this notion of of Russia being being the more important overriding um, ethnic uh, peoples over Ukrainians absolutely um, I mean I'm one of those um, I'm not exactly one of those I'm, I'm not an academic but I did study Russian and that was my yeah. interest that was my gateway into the into the subject yes. and what yes. always horrified me because I have um because I have uh an Irish part of my family and an Irish uh, ancestry I always found it fairly horrific at some of the um uh derisets or supercilious or or as you say the superior attitude uh, as mm. you would have got, you know, especially in the 70s mm. and uh, part of the 80s and, uh, you know, jokes, et cetera, demeaning jokes towards mm. uh, well, Ireland, towards Irish same. culture, language, et cetera. Um, so when mm. I spotted these same patterns, but far, far more intense and far more widespread of Ukrainian Russians uh, to Ukrainian language. And this isn't just, uh, you know, this isn't just sort of making making this stuff up, the sort of cultural superiority the imperial arrogance yes I mean, it's many, imperial many arrogance yeah. yeah um you know even if it's just the you know not necessarily cruel to someone saying oh well i can't take anything uh, ukrainian um says seriously because their language is so funny you know i mean mm -hmm. that in itself is is a conditioning someone's brain to mm -hmm. to demean mm -hmm. uh and diminish the value mm -hmm. It's interesting, the two languages as well. I, people often ask me, how, how do you distinguish, you know, don't, don't you speak or understand Russian? I said, no, I don't actually. Um, I can kind of get by if it's a very basic um, discussion, or not even a discussion, but if they're talking about something quite basic. Um, but, look, we may use the same Cyrillic alphabet given a few differences, but the way that it's put together and the way that we speak the languages is actually quite uniquely different. And um, they said, well, how do you tell whether, you know, it's a Russian speaking or it's a Ukrainian speaking? And look, I don't know how true this is. I've never really uh, researched it. But when I listen to the Russian language, it's quite a harsh language. And maybe that's just myself and my perception. But when I listen to Ukrainian language being spoken, it's a lot softer. Um, so I actually say that to people. I say, look, when I listen to the two languages, the Russian comes across as quite harsh. Just the word, yes, da. And we have a lot of Ukrainians coming out of Ukraine now, obviously from the East, and yes is da, drives me nuts. Our yeah. Ukrainian word for yes is tuck. Uh, tuck it's it's soft tuck i also um, wonder i mean i i old enough to have met people from that um uh, emigre generation that would have been mm -hmm. sort of middle middle class or very small class but there would have been middle class diplomatic class of russians it would have been clergy and so on or relatives of who, who fled the revolution and uh, again this may just be an impression it may be a false impression but it seemed to me that when they spoke russian um their voices intonation was softer and there was uh lots of structures built into the language i would call it respectful structures 
whereas mm. uh, Russian uh, that uh, I guess uh, after generations of of, of Bolshevism uh, has a certain imperative or commanding harsh quality to it. So I, I kind of wonder whether um, you know the language has changed uh, under under uh, decades of uh, even even harsher oppression. This has been absolutely fascinating, and I would love to dive deeper in in a future conversation. Um, mm. We're unfortunately out of time on this, um, but there are mm. so many fascinating topics to uncover, and we will, of course, pop links to uh, materials you've mentioned if they're published and available mm. on the internet. We're going to put lots of links into the description of this video. But it's been such a huge pleasure speaking to you. Thank you. The only other thing I would love to have added for you is I, I started to park the history of the Holodomor um, because things were then starting to come out um, the, in the media, uh, lots of YouTube uh, documentaries and so on and so forth. I started to write children's books and I sent you copies of the first three. I wanted to explain to children this particular part of history in our Ukrainian uh, history. And so it also it brings in the Ukrainian culture, uh, way of life, uh, things of interest to Ukrainian people. Um, and it's through a couple of grandmothers and chooks of all things, chickens. Um, so the, the notion of the Holodomor comes into the very first book. Uh, and then again in the second book and, and slowly it, it sort of morphs. Uh, into just stories of, of Ukrainian ethnicity. But again, it's this diaspora. So uh, this I am part of this diaspora that's trying hard to, to keep our culture going and, and keep uh, knowledge going of Ukrainian people. Uh, and now people are so much more open to it. You know, I, I wear Ukrainian uh, little bows and, and flags and everywhere I go, people know I'm Ukrainian um, because I've done a lot of presentations. Um, and in the past, I'd have to really push it um, to get presentations um, uh, in certain scenarios and now I'm getting the invitation so they know I'm Ukrainian they've, they've had my books all of our politicians our federal politicians have got my my books because I insist on them getting them um, so yeah it's easier now to try and get this history out but it's the diaspora that's now in control of um, ensuring that Ukraine never dies uh, in this particular way. So look, thank you so much for your time with me. I so appreciate it. As I said in the beginning, I've always felt like this this small pebble in a in a wide ocean because I'm so far away from everybody. But thank God for internet, uh, and thank God for this contact with uh, with your listeners. Um, I appreciate it very very much.